His eyes, he had black eyes like a shark. His father was killed in his bed, shot in the back of the head. They didn't call him dad. They called him it or the monster. The police were dead set on getting Stacy for this murder. I said to her, I know that you were involved in this. At some point, I'm coming after you. Well, this is a really disturbed person. She was terrified. They were going for the death penalty. Here in East Orlando, the neighborhoods are quiet, the streets safe, and the house is peaceful. Yet the home behind us conceals a terrible secret, one which still haunts the family that used to live here decades later. Richard and Marilyn Cannanin seemed like a typical happy couple when they first married. I've seen a picture of Richard and Marilyn when they were very young. They were beautiful, they were a gorgeous couple. He was a handsome man. But life soon turned dark for Marilyn. Richard broke Marilyn's arm while she was pregnant with their first child. Richard beat Marilyn from, from the beginning, is my understanding. He would kick her in the head, kick her in the stomach. She was uh, bloody regularly. At one point, he tried to drown her in the pool in their backyard. He held her underwater with, with his foot on her head. The couple eventually had three children, Ricky, Cheryl, and Stacy. They didn't call him dad. They called him it or the monster. Stacy's telling of him is that he was huge. He was over six feet tall, over 300 pounds. Stacy described his eyes, that he had black eyes like a shark. He used to play Russian roulette with the kids. He would take a loaded pistol and spin the barrel and put it up against their head, you know, and click, 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 click. And then one September day, he simply vanished. This happened in 1988. Cheryl had moved out by then. It was just Marilyn and Stacy in the house. Stacy came home from work one day and her mother told her he's gone. And she didn't have any explanation. She was very calm about it. It doesn't appear that anyone missed Richard Sr. His wife didn't call the police. His kids didn't say anything about it. He was just gone. Marilyn's middle daughter, Cheryl, had married and lived nearby. Until my father was gone, I don't think any of us thought we were ever going to be able to breathe or, or live, even if we didn't live in the house. He always found us. Once she was free from the monster, Marilyn opened up. She lived a normal life. She blossomed into this person that um, I think she always was this person. Marilyn's youngest daughter, Stacy, also remained in Orlando and soon fell in love. Susan's a little older than Stacy, but they became good friends. They weren't looking for a, a romance with another woman. They just fell in love and decided, well, this works for us. But life for Ricky Kananen, Marilyn's eldest son, hadn't gone as smoothly. Ricky was the, the first child. He was the only child for about eight to 10 years. And so he, of course, got the brunt of the abuse. Richard was a loner. He was gone a lot. Stacy and her girlfriend bought a house down the street from the mother's house. And then Richard moved in with them. Just, it's just, it's a block away. It was nice to come home to a cooked meal and, you know, they'd have game nights, they would go out to dinner and a movie. I think we started to relax and we started to breathe and it was a good feeling. But then, 15 years to the day after her husband vanished, Marilyn fails to show up for work. She worked for a training academy for Delta employees and she had been there 20 plus years. According to everyone who knew her, she was there early every morning. She was a very loyal and dependable employee. She had never done anything like this before. When Marilyn's coworker 
called Cheryl and said she didn't show up for work today. They all met at Marilyn's house. Ricky was the only one who had a key to the house. For the siblings, Marilyn's sudden disappearance could mean only one thing. Ricky was telling the girls, he came back, the nightmare is back, he's got her. So Cheryl and Stacy immediately began to panic. The last thing my dad ever said to me was, someday, somewhere, I'll get you, and I'm going to kill you, or I'm going to kill somebody that you care about. On the counter were papers from the Social Security Administration, and the coffee pot was left. There was all this disorder that they knew was not in their mother's personality. I stood in the kitchen by the refrigerator, and I got goosebumps, and I said, something's wrong. Something's terribly wrong. They called the police, and the police came to the house. Cheryl did most of the talking, but Ricky and Stacy were there in the room while the police report was filed. But with no signs of a forced entry or foul play, the detectives could only report Marilyn missing. And that might have been the end of it. For a couple of months after Marilyn disappeared, a new detective got this case. His name was Mark Hussey. Because of Cheryl's constant calling the sheriff's office and wanting to know what, you know, what are you doing to find my mother, um, the case was given to me. I began to look into it. This was Detective Hussey's very first murder case. He was just this gung-ho rookie cop who wanted to make a name for himself. Cheryl knew something about the bank records. And so she uh, provided us with some of the accounts and, and the names. And so we started to look into those. And there was a lot of money changing hands. And it wasn't going into the hands of Marilyn's missing husband. Marilyn's money was going to Ricky and to Stacy. There were checks being written electronically from an off-site computer that went to Stacy and Richard, but nothing to Cheryl and, and her kids. You know, they paid off their vehicles, and they, you know, Richard went out and paid cash for a brand new Dodge truck. Um, I think about $40,000 worth. It was the first of many clues that would convince the police to shift from a missing persons investigation to an active murder investigation focusing on two of the Canaan siblings, Stacy and Ricky. If your mother's just missing, the assumption is that she's going to come back at some point. I mean, you don't start remodeling the house and taking all the furniture out of there and stuff like that. Cheryl also started to get suspicious of her brother and sister. Mark had called me and he said, did you get money from your mom? No. Well, Stacy and Ricky did. And Stacy and Ricky have new cars. And Stacy and Ricky did this. And Stacy and Ricky did that. And, and it was all with my mom's stuff. The last straw for Cheryl was the garage sale. It was a Saturday morning. There was a yard sale going on. Some of the items that they were selling were Disney collectibles, little statues and plates and pins and things like that. He saw that Stacy and Susan were having a garage sale and selling Disney collectibles. And he knew that Marilyn's house was full of Disney collectibles. So he called Cheryl and said, your sister is selling your mother's stuff. I don't know if I thought that they had hurt her, but I knew that their stories were not adding up very quickly. And there came a point during the investigation that I was sure they knew what happened or where she was. I called the bank and I said, let's put a hold on that account and let's see how long it takes them to, you know, to contact us. I believe it was that same day that someone had called and asked why their account had been frozen. They left a phone number here in Orlando, called him back, and of course, uh, Richard Cannon answered the telephone. Detective Hussey asked Ricky to come in and just have a conversation, and Ricky volunteered for Stacy to come in. They interrogated Stacy in a separate room. At the end of Stacy's questioning, that's when they just sort of dropped a ball on her that, you know, your brother had something to do with this. So they brought her into his room, closed the door behind them, and just let them talk. 
It's a technique that we frequently use. We'll, we'll put suspects together in a room, and sometimes they talk to each other. They sit there, and, uh, and a lot of times they will make incriminating statements. So Stacy and Richard are together in this interrogation room. They're whispering back and forth across the table. At one point, they hold hands and look at each other intently. Now, some of that's audible, not all of it. Richard, at one point, seems to say, it's the gas chamber for me. The problem was, for us that day, is that uh, they were whispering. We couldn't hear it. And eventually, they just let them go. They just let them go. Unbeknownst to them, police had put a tracking device on their vehicle. They go buy NyQuil and sleeping tablets and go to one of Richard's storage units. They ran an exhaust hose into the car. They took the NyQuil, they took the sleeping medication. They each scrawled a short suicide note. Ricky tells Cheryl that he loves her, and Stacy says goodbye to Susan, writing, we had a part in mother's leaving. Everything was on track until police arrived. We got a phone call from my sergeant, and he said, we just picked up Richard and Stacy. They tried to commit suicide. They were on their way to the hospital. We sent two detectives over there to interview them. I don't think they got too much from Stacy, but Richard was more forthcoming. Upon being questioned by investigators in the hospital, Richard confesses not just to the murder of his father, but also to the murder of his mother. He told us that his father was buried at the mother's house and that their mother was buried in their backyard over on Okaloosa Avenue. Mr. Kanana was buried deep in the ground, um, I'd say six or eight feet deep. He was wrapped in a plastic tarp and then also wrapped in, in his bedclothes, his sheets and things. He was killed in his bed, shot in the back of the head. Based on what Richard had told us, we knew where to look for mother. She was buried in a very shallow grave. She was wrapped in plastic garbage bags and then duct taped. The autopsy revealed that uh, her mouth and nose had been duct taped also. We also found some taser darts. She was tased prior to being suffocated. With a confession in hand, the police arrest Ricky and charge him with the murder of both Marilyn Cannanin and Richard Cannanin Sr. Investigators then turn their attention to Stacy, who they are convinced is an accomplice to both murders, perhaps even the mastermind. When she woke up in the emergency room, immediately, as soon as her eyes started fluttering, detectives were asking her questions. Did you kill your mother? Did you kill your father? They thought she might have something to do with it, but there was no evidence. There was nothing to legally keep her confined in any way, so they let her go home. Detective Mark Hussey clearly is dead set on getting Stacy for this murder. He's convinced that she was involved in her mother's killing. You know, it's pretty plain what, you know, what she says. You know, she says, uh, you know, Ricky and I um, had something to do with mom's leaving. Well, mom didn't leave. Mom was buried in the backyard at her house. There was never any doubt in my mind that, uh, that she knew exactly what was going on. I said to her, I know that you were involved in this, and uh, at some point, I'm coming after you. You're going to be arrested for this. Coming up, the state of Florida sets a date for the trial of Richard Cannanin Jr. for the murder of his parents. On May 1st, 2007, everyone was ready for the murder trial of Richard Cannanin Jr., but he surprised everybody when he took a plea deal. The day that she found out was the day that the police showed up to arrest her. At that point, Stacy Cannon is arrested and charged with the murder not only of her mother, but also with her father's murder. Just weeks before Ricky Cannon was to go on trial for the murder of his mother, he accepts a plea deal from prosecutors. 30 years in prison in exchange for testifying that his sister was a willing accomplice to murder. You know, the case raised my eyebrows from the beginning because she's indicted within days of Richard having taken this plea and told his umpteenth version of this story. 
there was just clearly no evidence. I mean, nothing to back up Richard's story. I want you to pay attention to what evidence existed and when. Because the only thing that changed between them only having a case against Richard in December of 2003 and Stacy being arrested for murder in May of 2007 is that her brother decided to leave his fifth version of what had happened. Diana Tennis was a very accomplished local attorney. She held her own. But the prosecution had two siblings who were prepared to testify that Stacy was complicit in the murders of both her father and mother. I was told by the detective that my father had been shot in the back of the head, and he was sure that my sister had done it because she was the only one around at the time. The lead prosecutor in this case was Robin Wilkinson. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, September 10th, 2003, Marilyn Tanannan, a mother of three children, left her work at the Delta Connection Academy to never be seen again. She's frankly a little attack dog. You know, she's not going to cut anyone any slack. Ladies and gentlemen, they the prosecution had to sell to the jury this idea that Stacy's behavior after her mother's disappearance was not reasonable. The takeaway from Cheryl Cannon's testimony was really that her siblings seemed completely unconcerned about their mother's disappearance. After your mother was missing, are you still calling the sheriff's office all the time? Constantly. Does your sister Stacy ever call you to talk about your mother? Never. What about Richard? Never. They didn't do any of the normal things that one might expect from children looking for their missing elderly mother. But the most damaging testimony would be Ricky's. The prosecution's case was based almost entirely on Richard Cannon Jr.'s testimony. Richard the moment Richard Cannon and Jr. enter the courtroom is really memorable to me still. We knew that Richard Jr. had struggled mentally, that he lived in a very dark and violent reality in his mind. He, he was unshaven. He really played the part of this crazy guy living in his own reality. Mr. Cannon, did you kill your mother? Excuse me? Did you kill your mother? Yes, I did. And was someone there to assist you in killing your mother? Yes, there was. And who was that? Stacy, my sister. Robin had to prove that Stacy was a willing and full participant in the murder of a mother. She wasn't a coerced accomplice. And when you were planning to kill your mother, what did Stacy say and how she wanted to do this? She just wanted her dead. Richard says that both planned the, the killing, um, took their mother out for a movie and dinner. Do you remember what movie you saw? Yeah, Charlie Angels 2. Came back to the house and they were talking like nothing was going on. Stacy, though, had a taser. So they were all standing around talking. She tased her mother. Where were you when Stacy tased your mother? I was sitting down at the breakfast nook counter. Her mother falls to the floor, and Richard then pulls out a bandana. Can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how did you suffocate your mother? I took a bandana and put it over her over mouth and her nose. When do you pull the bandana up? After a while. Why'd you pull it off? There wasn't more breathing. As he describes, Stacy using the taser on her mother, him suffocating her, Stacy at the defense table begins to crack just a little bit. She's been very composed up until this point. It was the first time that we'd really seen emotion from her. What was your sister doing as you're suffocating your mother? She was standing over there, over me. During the trial when he was testifying, he looked at my sister a lot. I think he never thought that my sister would be free this long. And um, he was finally doing the right thing. Did you carry your mother by yourself? 
No, I'll stay with you. I'm a carrier. Once you put her in the trunk, what did y'all do? Go to the storage area where we had freezer. Or put her in the freezer, parked the car in the storage area, and went back to the house. One of the really telling pieces of evidence, according to prosecutors, is the suicide note. The suicide note was a problem. I mean, that certainly is not a piece of evidence that I went in thinking, oh, they're, they're totally going to understand why it is she would do this without it being an acknowledgment of guilt or, oh my gosh, I killed mom. And you wrote this part of the note, it was the rest of page one. Yes. This portion here, whose handwriting is that? Stacy's. I go into every trial believing that it's winnable. On the other hand, you know, part of your job is to assess likelihoods so that people can decide, should I, should I take the offer on the table or go for broke? You know, part of the job is giving people a real good, honest, objective assessment of that. I thought there was a very good chance we could lose. When we return, the jury hears horrifying testimony about the Cananan's father, Richard Sr. We went in the bedroom, he locked the door, he pulled out a handgun. It's a mystery that's captivated the nation. This stretch is just so beyond what anyone could imagine. And left a trail of dead bodies. Lori Vallow Daybell, accused of triple murder, including her two youngest children. You'll hear every dramatic moment. Money, power, and sex. That's what this case is about. Just tell the truth. It's that simple. The Doomsday Cult Mom Murder Trial. Coverage continues weekday mornings only on 4TV. After being implicated by her siblings for the murder of her mother, Stacy Kinnanen faced the daunting task of trying to convince the jury that her version of what happened was the truth. Part of her just couldn't wait to get it over with. But of course, she was also terrified because once it's over, if she doesn't get the verdict she wants, they were going for the death penalty. Ms. Tennis, call your witness. <clears throat> Defense would call Stacy Kinnanen. We were all pretty surprised, I think, when Stacy took the stand. He some swear or firm, by all accounts, all of these children were horrifically abused. Marilyn Cannanon was horrifically abused. I think that the evidence is going to show you that that culture of abuse is going to leave you with a number of people who don't ever act the way non-abused people are going to act in any given situation. A lot of this is not going to make sense. Calling your own defendant to the stand is a tough, tough decision. You know, it's always a gamble. To me, it was never a question. There were enough legitimate questions brought up by that evidence that I didn't think were going to go unanswered. Moving forward in time to the events that took place in the truck in the storage unit. Yes. So do you recognize the <coughs> documents laying on the dashboard of that vehicle Yes, I do. And did you write that document? Yes, I did. The creepy part of this case is that Richard Sr., you know, all six, four of them, of evil, really, loomed over that courtroom. One of the most shocking points in, in the testimony to me about Richard Sr. was one night when he had taken his girls for a drive, he stopped at a bar, got hammered. And how old would you have been? Uh, sixth grade, I'm not sure of the age. <clears throat> um, and then he decided, well, we'll go back home. I don't know, it was after the bar closed, two in the morning, one in the morning. And when we came in the house, my sister went to where we had our bunk beds. He told my mother, you're not sleeping in the room with me. Stacy's going in the room with me. Uh, my brother was sleeping in the living room on a pull-out sofa at that time. We went in the bedroom, he locked the door, he pulled out a handgun, um, and then he raped me with the gun in my, in my mouth. The way that this affected Stacy is that she learned to just shut up and just be, be as invisible as possible. Tell the jury, what did you learn when you were a child about defending yourself? The more you fought back, the more you argued, the worse you got beaten or raped or whatever the abuse was of the day. 
Staying passive and doing what she was told was a strategy that helped Stacy survive years of her father's horrific abuse. But on the day of the interrogation, that strategy failed when she was confronted by a manipulative and suicidal brother bent on taking her down with him. This was her brother, her protector. Suddenly she's hearing, he's a murderer. She didn't know how to react to this because this was a new circumstance. Ricky convinced her that the police are going to arrest them both. They're going to go to jail. She finds out that law enforcement, in fact, thinks mom is dead and perhaps buried in her yard and that her brother had something to do with it. And there's $100,000 missing and your, your hands are all over this. And she's got her girlfriend of 15 years who she knows is going to be swept up in this. Susan benefited from the money. The body's also in Susan's backyard. At this point, Stacy was so overwhelmed. When do you recall there being the first conversation about there being an actual suicide attempt? He told me that because Susan and I own that house and because that body was going to be found in my backyard, if I didn't kill myself or do something to myself, that they surely would come after Susan also. She was just sort of tired and out of it and, and didn't really know what was going on, was just trying to sort of get this over with. And somehow, Richard apparently convinces Stacy that the only way out is to kill themselves. When she wrote the suicide note, what she explained she meant by the line, we had a part in mother's leaving, is she felt genuinely responsible that if she hadn't invited Ricky to live with them, their mom would still be alive. Coming up, the jury hears about a disturbing draft of a novel written by Ricky called Scales of Justice. The flesh and the small lines of blood roll down the arm and drips down. They look at you trying to find compassion, mercy, but all they see is dark pools of hell. It's very, very graphic, and diving into that sort of dark mind was really jarring and really uncomfortable. The jury had seen testimony into what the defense claimed was the mind of Ricky the Manipulator. Now, the jurors were about to look deep into what the defense claimed was the mind of a murderer. It was a handwritten document, this thick stack of papers, and it was called The Scales of Justice. The draft novel was discovered by Susan and Stacy, who turned it over to police after Ricky was first arrested. It contained chilling descriptions of its main character killing child abusers with his bare hands. To see the fear in the eyes as you squeeze their throat as the larynx is being crushed. In it, he tells a story of a young man who grows up to save abused children. The way the victims in his novel were bound had eerie similarities to how Marilyn's body was found. You see them trying to cry out, but the duct tape works so well. Their hands and feet spread eagle and tied down so very little movement can happen. This book is, in part, autobiographical, correct? Some of it is what happened in my of childhood, yes. If you look at the 200-page manuscript that he wrote, this is more than just a guy with a bad history who wants to write a quasi-autobiographical novel. This is a really kind of disturbed person. The main character's father's name is Richard, correct? I guess so. And it's about a abused child who kills his abusive parent? Yes. I think at the core of it, this man may seriously, genuinely be very mentally ill. After casting doubt on the sanity of the state's star witness, Tennis next turned her attention towards the main weakness of its case against Stacy. The prosecution really had a tough job here. Their evidence was pretty much circumstantial. They had nothing directly to tie Stacy to this crime. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Ms. Tennis. One of the things I was most impressed with Diana Tennis about is that when she was interviewing Detective Hussey on the stand, she was able to, uh, through a series of very common sense questions, show that he hadn't done his, his job. You know, I think a lot of it um, didn't add up. 
missing persons had a case that had gone somewhat cold as far as uh, where to find this missing woman, correct? Correct. And so they give it to uh, the new kid on the block to play with. Yes, ma'am, they did. I think the jury ultimately wanted something other than Ricky to tell them how this thing went down. That doesn't mean that the cut ends of the tape could not have been swabbed and tested for DNA, correct? I don't know that. You'd have to talk to the crime scene people. I'm not sure. Did you ever talk to anybody about having that tape tested for DNA? I don't recall. I think that the CSI television shows have hurt us. And the jurors are, are all lay people. They, they obviously don't, um, don't know a lot about uh, uh, physical evidence and how it's collected and what it means and, and uh, things like that. When you don't send a single piece of evidence to the crime lab to even try to give the jury something forensic, something scientific to hold on to, I think they hold that against the prosecution. Then Diana Tennis turned to Detective Hussey's testimony about the allegedly nefarious garage sale. The garage sale. Oh my gosh. I don't even know what to say about the yard sale other than um, if I, I don't even know what to say about the yard sale. At the time that you went by to look at the garage sale, had you ever been in Susan and Stacey's home? No, ma'am. They don't have a witness to say, I was at the yard sale, and one of mom's eagles was labeled with a dollar sign. They had um, a detective who went by and said there was Disney stuff for sale, and evidence that mom collected Disney stuff. But Stacy and Susan also loved Disney collectibles. And in fact, you were never able to actually determine whether any of the Disney stuff you saw at the garage sale was Disney stuff that belonged to mom. No, ma'am, I wasn't. I guess the assumption that the jury was supposed to leap to was that my client was selling mom's stuff um, for dollars and that that would be a motive for having killed her. Now, the conversation where you talk to Richard Kinnanen about the actual facts surrounding the killing of his mother takes up three transcribed pages. Does that sound about right? Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at that, but uh, sounds about right. It was as the trial was going on that this, this picture of Marilyn was getting, for me, clearer than it had ever been before. And he tells you that they go to the 6 o'clock showing of Charlie's Angels at the Dollar Theater on Colonial in Orlando, Florida, correct? Charlie's Angels too, I believe. That's right. She is not a woman who would have done what Richard claims they did on that night of the week at that time in her life. It just doesn't jive. Like going to a 6 o'clock movie when Marilyn would normally just be headed home from work. I will have to admit that didn't actually occur to me until after Detective Hussey's testimony. Um, and it actually occurred to me while he was testifying and she was waving the document around. That document was an EPAS record showing Marilyn's location the evening that Ricky claimed the murder took place. You talked yesterday about the EPAS transponder records, correct? Do you recall talking about that yesterday? Yes, I do. And you recall talking about the last transponder entry on September 10, 2003, at 5.53 in the afternoon, where she would have been located at University and 417, correct? That's correct. Well, you knew already that Marilyn Cannon was not at a 6 o'clock movie on December 10th, correct? I don't, I don't know that. What? Well, she's either in a movie theater at 6 o'clock, per Richard's story, um, or she's 20 minutes away from home on her way back in her car uh, per the EPAS records. And so she's not home until, call it 6.15. You knew that she was somebody who wore work clothes to work and not work clothes to not work, correct? I did find that out later, yes. So she would have had to, at the very least, change clothes, correct? Yes, ma'am. And then they would have had to have gotten to the theater, correct? Yes. So a six o'clock movie just flat out didn't happen, right? Probably. I don't think it made or broke the case, but I think it was 
a part of his picture that just didn't ring true. Coming up, the defense and prosecution rest their case, the media settles in for a long night, and then... The phone call came in. The jury's back already. We've all heard that when a jury comes back fast, that's a guilty verdict. A minister gunned down. Now, a New Hampshire man stands trial for murder. Prosecutors say they have fingerprint evidence found on a Glock handgun near the crime scene that links Castiglione to Garcia's death. The defendant was allegedly found praying over the victim's body. Court TV cameras are taking you inside the courtroom for every dramatic moment. The Murdered Minister Trial. Live coverage next week following jury selection on Court TV. That last day of trial was really long. We were all, like, ready to go to bed, basically. Stacy and Susan and Diana, they went out to dinner just down the block from the courthouse. My fiancé calls it the last dinner, that waiting for the verdict. We're all over at that Italian restaurant together, and it's anxiety. I was very, very, very scared. You know, they read the word guilty, she gets cuffed, she gets taken to jail, and she's never getting out again. Late into the evening, the jury was sent out to deliberate. It's a Florida thing. They don't break and come back the next day, in my experience. We, we often stay late. So when the phone call came in, you know, Diana said, the jury's back already. It had only been a couple hours. I don't remember exactly how long it was, but it was that same night they came back in. It's always a procedure. You know, the jury comes into the room, and, and it's not instant. The jury gave the papers to the clerk, the clerk gave it to the judge, the judge read it, gave it back to the clerk. You'll publish the verdict. And she's just waiting, waiting, waiting. And then when they read for this count, yada, 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 case number, et cetera, et cetera. State of Florida versus Stacey Kinnan. Verdict, as to count one. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. So say we all this 12th day of March, 2010, at Orlando Orange County, Florida, signed by the four person. Do you want to pull the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Pull the jury, please. I'm going to call you by your badge number. Well, I'm a crier, so I immediately start the waterworks, because that's what I do. Yes, ma'am. She cried, too. I think we were both somewhat surprised, and I think we were both incredibly relieved. If you want to wait for your paperwork, you can. If not, you're free to go. Thank you, Your Honor. It was just, it was this beautiful moment. I hate to say that about a murder trial, but it really was, it was a stunning moment. For Detective Hussey, the verdict came as a surprise. I adhere to the, to the philosophy that it's better to let a, a, a guilty person walk than it is to put an innocent person in jail. But for Cheryl, the exoneration was a shock. Let's go. Hi, baby. My sister's there with her suit and her supporters. And, you know, my brother fit the package that they wanted to fit. He looked like the murderer, and he looked like the horrible person. And let's just tie this all up and put it on a bow and send him away, and we won't have to think about this anymore. I know in my heart that justice wasn't done. No doubt in my mind. That was so wonderful. Coming up, Stacy tries to put the trial behind her and forgive her brother for implicating her in the death of their mother. She was devastated because this was her brother and they'd been through so much together and he'd always been her protector. After being exonerated, Stacy Kinnanen returned to Florida where she has tried to put it all behind her. The death of her mother, the trauma of being accused as an accomplice in the murder of her parents, and a trial that could have ended in her execution. She really just wants to move on with her life. That's the reason I'm doing this for her, because I know the story probably better than anyone else other than maybe Susan. Despite being cleared of all charges, Stacy remains haunted by the shadow of the monster. She couldn't get a job that would pay her well and treat her with respect because all anybody had to do was Google her name. And boom, there you, you've got a murder suspect. So she had a really hard time finding good work. 
The trial also put incredible stress on her relationship with Susan, who is currently being treated for cancer. It wasn't just Stacy's life that was being affected by this, but she still stuck by her side, and, you know, they're together to this day. They, they didn't let this tear them apart. She has yet to fully recover from her older brother's betrayal. On one hand, she, she was devastated because this is her brother, and they'd been through so much together, and he'd always been her protector. She couldn't believe that he was doing this. On the other hand, she's fully aware that Ricky, even though he may have committed murder and he may have done all these crimes, he didn't really stand a chance from day one. How else could he possibly have turned out? If there's one person Stacy is bitter about, it's Detective Hussey. Oh, she absolutely felt victimized by him. She felt as if he had a vendetta against her specifically. This wasn't just professional interest. He had it in for her. He wanted to nail a suspect, and he didn't care how he did it. This wasn't a top-notch, we're going to just investigate the heck out of this until we get to the truth. This was, I'm pissy that I don't have probable cause. I'm going to tell her I'm not happy about that. And then four and a half years later, when Crazy Richard tells me what I want to hear, I'm going to run off and get an indictment. It really, it sends a shiver up my spine when I think about how she could have gotten railroaded for not just one, but two murders that from the beginning she said I didn't have anything to do with and that they've really never had what I would consider to be solid evidence. Testifying in court about the horrific abuse that she and her siblings suffered at the hands of their father brought that painful abuse back to life. But it also led Stacy to get help and begin to heal from the monstrous actions of the one person she believes to be most responsible for the death of their mother. If he hadn't been the person he was, none of this would have happened. Ricky would not have become who he became. One of his biggest fears is becoming his own father. And he tried not to. He genuinely tried not to. And in many ways, he did not. But in enough ways, he did. Ricky Kinnanen remains here at the Zephyr Hills Medium Security Correctional Institution. He has served most of his 30-year sentence and is scheduled to be released in June of 2029. Stacy mourns the loss of her sister. She would like to have a relationship with her sister. She she wanted to, but it just they were never able to repair it. I don't feel justice was served, but she's my sister, just like Ricky's my brother. It's not gonna bring my mom back or my dad, but a part of me loves him. You can't live the way that we did and come out of it normal. There's no way.